Time for another show on aviation. Paul Brennan here in Wellington and... Martin Noakes, still in Melbourne and only just judging by the landing I had last Monday. Oh, what happened there? <laughs> Came in through a thunderstorm, lightning on both sides of the plane was quite exciting. What sort of aircraft? A320 coming in from Wellington. Exciting great, stuff, huh? It, it was pretty cool, and um, I mean, it was spectacular because we came in just to the north of the city. So, you know, thunderstorm clouds everywhere, and then um, this lightning was going down in the city and, and on the other side. And the great thing about it, though, was um, we got to the airport, and the arrivals was absolutely deserted because all the Asian flights had come in early in the morning, they had all delayed to uh, probably to avoid the storms or were, you know, were circling north of the, you know, far north of the city. So it was sort of emptied out? From the plane, I was on the bus in about 10 minutes. And did you get warning coming uh, into the area? Did the oh, they said come it was on say it's going to be rough? No, they said it would be a bit bumpy, yeah, but didn't say it was going to be very rough. And I must admit it wasn't very rough, yeah, but, yeah. but we were doing a bit of, you know, twisting and turning. Wow, when did you uh, pop out of the cloud, as it were? Well, the cloud was pretty high, so going through the cloud, it didn't feel thunderstormy. It's only when we got below it and saw the lightning and all that around us and that it, that it started getting a bit bumpy. So it was, it was pretty high. You can get some very hairy weather in Sydney, very hairy mm. from time to time, those hailstorms. And I've seen some pictures taken at uh, Kingsford Smith Airport, you know, with huge thunder clouds coming over, very dramatic. Sydney's very um, windy as well, often very windy. Melbourne seems to be, yeah, it seems to be a bit calmer. I think it's, Melbourne weather's are probably a bit more um, fronty, you know, they just get big southerly fronts or, or, or westerly fronts coming through. Speaking of uh, dramatic, gosh, the MH370 story's not going away, is it? A couple of shows ago, um, you mentioned Tim Clark and some of the comments he's been making, of course, CEO of Emirates. I think they operate over 100 777, so... A lot of um, skin in the game there, alluding to some uh, odd behaviour from the Malaysians, a uh, possibility of, of cargo on board that someone might have been after tampering with the electronics bay. Remember a few shows back, or quite a while back, we had that video that you found of, I think it was a um, LL 777, where the pilot actually showed you how you could go down into the equipment hold under yeah. the uh, floor. You know, it wasn't difficult. And... Yeah, all these questions, and it seems that the plot is thickening. What do you think's going on here? Well, Tim Clark basically came out and called the Malaysian authorities liars, which was pretty strong stuff. Um, the guy who does the Crikey blog in um, Australia, um, Plain Talking Crikey blog, um, he's been after them for a while because he thinks the whole um, Australian investigation, because the Australians have to do the investigation because the plane came down in their search area. Yeah, He's basically calling them out for making it a sham because he thinks it's quite obvious that they're not following up obvious leads. There is that um, story about the debris field that was identified quite early on in the piece that contained large pieces of debris, sort of, you know, 8 by 23 meters, which roughly corresponds to the size of a 777 wing. Um, when the Malaysian authorities were called, their attention was called to it, they, they basically told them to go and look somewhere else. It, it, it's almost as if they didn't want people to find it. So the way it's sort of coming together is, uh, if we're to pull the strands together, that aircraft took off with some sort of cargo on board of interest to, I don't know, um, criminal underworld or a particular group out there somewhere who proceeded to hijack the aircraft did actually get into the equipment bay, let's say, under the floor to deactivate certain items of equipment that track the aircraft's position easily. And um, with some sort of perhaps uh, advanced knowledge or training or, or, or knowing what to do in this case, indicating, you know, quite a plan. And what, something's gone wrong? The aircraft has, there's been a fight back from the crew or some passengers, the aircraft's gone out of control or something happened didn't it yes i mean obviously it's all conjecture at this point but there are a number of inconsistencies in the malaysian authorities handling of the situation um, satellite pictures that clearly showed a debris field in a different area that wasn't publicized and wasn't followed up and then the fact that there's that one malaysian member of the malaysian government basically admitted that they'd had a transponder um, response from the plane that showed that it had turned in a certain directory much earlier and much more definitely than anybody had admitted to in the past. So 
it, yeah, it, it, the plot does thicken. And why would there be a cover-up? What, to protect security information uh, so people don't understand your capability of, of what sort of equipment you might be operating to monitor your borders? Uh, and why would other nations stay silent as well? It would have to be something quite serious to keep everybody quiet, wouldn't it? Yeah, the inconsistencies are mounting up. And I mean, I don't even think you have to be much of a conspiracy theorist now to realize that, um, yeah, the truth is not being told. The truth is out there, as they say. Well, um, let's see what happens next. It's pretty out there for a CEO of a major airline like that to come out and, you know, tell the government that they're talking garbage. Yeah, there's something uh, driving that. We got a few visits recently, uh, Martin, uh, heads of state, which always means, you know, Air Force One for that particular country makes an appearance. Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, was in a few weeks ago. I see she came in on an A340-300, was it? Style, eh? Luftwaffe A340-300, that is. Yeah, they used to fly A310s, I think, didn't they? They did. They've had them out here in the past. I remember when mm. the German president came out, he came out on an A310. I even took some uh, footage of it at the time. Obviously, don't quite have the range or the capacity of the A340. No, I mean, if you're going to go long distance, and uh, you know, a long range, um, light A340-300 would be very comfortable. Um, at the time, I was looking at Flight Radar 24, at the, all the various aircraft that were going into um, Brisbane, and for the whole of the conference, the Australian Air Force had one of their A330 tankers circling sort of between Toowoomba and Ipswich oh. at 22,000 feet and 300 knots because the Air Force F-18s were patrolling oh, all over. right, and they had to stay airborne. Yeah, and, and there were some pretty interesting planes at the airport. I know President Zuma from South Africa rocked up in a... Super 27, 727 conversion. Oh, really? I didn't realize that. What, with the uh, more powerful engines and the winglets and, and sort of kit it out that way? Yeah. I don't know the routing he took, but I would have presumed, just, I don't know, off the top of my head, it might have come via Sri Lanka or something like that. Right. Yeah, it wouldn't come across the um, southern Indian Ocean, would it? No. No way. That's a long one, isn't it? Yeah. We had the president of China, Xi Jinping, here, and I see he came in on an Air China, which is the state airline, they're all state airlines, it's the main international carrier, though, isn't it? Uh, yeah. 747 I thought they might uh, take that opportunity to come in one of their new eight intercontinentals. Is that 400 a, a passenger 400, or is it a VIP slash passenger 400? It's got the customer code, you know, after the model, as if it is a normal part of the fleet but maybe it has a kit in it you know first class area that can be pulled out and have a vip bit yeah maybe they haven't sorted out the 747 800s that they can do that yet well i think they take the press with them as well so probably most of the economy seats in the uh, airline are uh, uh, useful for that purpose you can take everybody along you take your staff you take your press and i imagine in china a lot of press would accompany a presidential visit there's so many networks i see the um the American Press Association chartered a Delta 777-200LR to fly there, the press corps, um, directly from Brisbane back to Washington, D.C. Yes, I saw that. Gosh, that's a real uh, long flight, isn't it? It is, and an expensive one, too. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, they couldn't get the 74400 into Wellington for his uh, trip down to Wellington, and they brought in a 7378 just for that. I think he went down to the South Island on that, too, perhaps. And that looked just like a regular um, commercial airliner as well. It didn't look VIP. Okay. So quite an effort. Yeah. To get the president around. And didn't he bring a, a transporter in as well to bring the, uh, I think a week before he arrived in Brisbane, a, a transporter dropped off all the cars. Oh, okay. Yes, I saw he had a particular limo, which I, I hadn't seen before. <laughs> mm. uh, looked like a Chinese model, you know. Yeah. So there you go. Uh, now, locally, of course, uh, the news of Air New Zealand cutting its C-1900 beach fleet and cutting off those routes, what, Kaitaia, uh, Fakatani, some services out of Taupo, Westport cut off. And uh, predictably, Martin, a few are starting to talk about filling the gap. There's a service up Kaitaia Way that's talking about starting up aircraft uh, in the sort of the 12 to 19 seat range. You'd be in a pretty good position to bargain out the local district council for some sort of contribution to that, wouldn't you? If you're in that yeah. situation. It's a Jetstream 31 they want to fly, isn't it? Yeah, that's one of the uh, potential operators. Uh, Sun yeah. Air Aviation is the the story I'm looking at here. And uh, they're already up and running. So, you know, it's not as if these services have to start from scratch. You've already got small operators who can sort of 
up the age quickly. And you can see that these communities are probably going to end up with an air service. And uh, again, after Air New Zealand pulls out, and I see that Sounds Air has brought in a brand new, or pretty well new, Grand Caravan. So they're going to operate a few new routes as well. So all is not lost. Yeah, but I'm not seeing any PC-12s coming in. Ah, uh, well, obviously no one heard us talking about them. That, no. That's quite an investment. Isn't it? I mean, I see they're 4.1 million US brand new per aircraft, so... That's nothing. Speaking of China, I see China Southern are uh, upgaging. There's that word again, from A330s to 777-300s uh, from their cities in China through to Auckland. So that shows growth. And didn't um, John Key and the Chinese president announce that Air China's going to be flying in? I think they might be going daily. Wow. They're operating 777-300s, I think, as well. Wow, that's a lot of planes, eh? I wonder if we'll start to see their 747-8s on the route. Because you'd think that with the growth in that country, the potential for tourism is huge, that it wouldn't take too long to fill the really big aircraft. No, and a 747-8 would be a welcome addition. Be one of the few 747s in Auckland, if that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's hardly any aid. Like the other day, I was in Sydney and... There were three 747 operators there. Of course, there was Qantas, which is probably regretting having so many. There was one single Thai Airlines plane, and there was a freighter. That was it. Yeah. Yes, the old days, uh, they're over all right, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Uh, receding into history. It won't be long before, well, you won't see any of them. Speaking of receding into history, the MD-11 is about to become history in passenger terms anyway. I think KLM were the last operator, weren't they? Yes, they were, yeah. And I think uh, they've finished their goodbye, farewell enthusiast flights, and they're all off to Victorville for, well, we know what happens there. So that's um, a very long time uh, association between KLM and uh, Douglas and McDonnell Douglas. I think it goes back to the DC-2, doesn't it? Yep, they operated every model from the DC-2. Incredible. Yep. They stuck with them all the way. They did very successfully, too. I mean, they didn't have any trouble with the MD-11s. They seemed to really like them. Yeah, um, and operated them for a long time. Why do you think they stayed in service so long? Because no one else went anywhere near that for uh, yeah. passenger operations. Well, the Dutch are normally pretty pragmatic, so I reckon, you know, if they were making a dollar, they'd have stuck with it. Also, it does have good range. The late model MD-11s really did have good range. They got yeah. it. They, they tweaked it in the end. I think it was, what, about 7,200 miles? And they probably got them for nothing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you think of all the parts. Yeah. Because a lot of them went early to the desert, didn't they? Yeah. So that's uh, an end of that era, the MD-11 passenger era gone, and, and the last of the, I don't think we'll see trijets again, will we? No, unfortunately, no. That's the end of it, I reckon. Unless maybe in 50 years there'll be a blended wing body with three engines stuck up on the back, but it won't be the same. How do you think the Boeing fanboys and girls in the United States are reacting to the Delta Airbus order? Well, a lot of them are pretty outraged, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how do you explain that one away? Price. Price and, I think, performance. Everyone's saying, oh, it's price and availability. The only reason they bought them is because Airbus are giving them away. But I've read some analysis, and, and I think, no doubt, availability is is useful because the sooner you can get into more efficient aircraft, the sooner you're operationally more efficient. But it turns out that um, in terms of performance, they're very hard to beat. It seems that the 787-900 is a little bit too small. The 777-200LR is too much aircraft and too expensive to operate. And the 777-Xs are just too big for Delta's requirements and will only be available in eight years. And the analysis shows, this is actually fascinating, that a smartened up, you know, significantly smartened up, but still 20-year-old airframe, the A330-300, if you slap some new engines on it and tidy it up a bit, on routes up to 5,000 miles is cheaper per passenger to fly than a 7879, which is a bit of a worry. Well, the bean counters are going to understand that pretty quick, aren't they? Yes, and apparently Delta's bean counters are very, very thorough. So they've gone for the A330, uh, one of the new versions. The A330-900neo and the A350-900. Right. And they're going to use the A330s on their European routes, and they're going to use the A350s on the Pacific routes. The very long over waters. Very long over waters. And 
looking at the spreadsheets on various sites, it is very, very interesting how competitive the A330 is against the 787. Isn't that amazing that mm -hmm. um, uh, such a, a period separates the two? One has mm -hmm. been sold as a new sort of technology game changer, yet it's still outclassed by the uh, the older one. Now, I mean, is there a precedent for that? I guess there is somewhere um, out there, but th that's sort of ironic. It's It's sort of crazy in a way. Some of the analysts are saying this is a very tricky situation for Boeing because although the 787 per flight is slightly cheaper to run because it is, after all, slightly higher technology, the pricing that Airbus can offer on a fully depreciated production line is such that you'd have to fly the planes for like 25 years to get the benefit. And you're never going to do that now. And, and you're never going to do that. So, yeah, the A330 will make money from day one. Delta are going to order more aircraft into the future as well. Uh, they've got uh, quite a, um, a stack of A330s from Northwest, right? So there must be a, at least a couple of dozen yep. already in the fleet, which at some point they will look to replace. Plus, I see there's uh, well over 100, I think, uh, 767 300s that that airline operates that at some point in the next five years will have to be replaced. There's rumors already starting that, you know, watch the space for the 767s and watch the pricing from Airbus because price Airbus have got that production gap they want to fill between the, the run out models of the classic A330 and the, and the ramping up of the A330 Neo line. So they're going to want to sell as many classic A330s as they can for probably for cost, just so they can keep the production line yes, running. Exactly. Yeah. And then at the other end of the scale, if, if um, Delta need more capacity, there's nothing to stop them buying the A350-1000, which doesn't really have a direct competitor. You either have to go much bigger with the new 777X, or you have to go shorter range with the um, 787-1000. So the Airbus is in a very good space, funnily enough, with American Airlines who don't want the huge capacity planes. It has a feel of a sort of a, um, Airbus snookering, in a way, Boeing. They've sort of snookered them. They've they, they kind of have. Put them in a um, corner. The, there was a very interesting article about the, the, the comparison between the 737 and the A320, and of course the 737 has outsold the A320 because... Well, it has 20 great. years more of sales in there. Well, exactly. If you take it from the date the A320 came into service, which was 1984, which was 16 years after the 737, A320 has outsold the 737 from that date. Airbus will be very happy to have that customer. Well, but this is the first time Delta have actually directly bought an Airbus product. Yeah, because they, they had A310s, but they got those from Pan Am when they, uh, was yeah, it Pan every time Am they, they absorbed, or one of those airlines anyway, yeah. They've always ended up inheriting them, and I remember oh, when, when um, Delta, they took over Northwest, didn't they? Yes, they did, yeah. And I remember at the time, several um, commenters in the various forums were saying, there'll be a cold ban hell before Delta ever fly an A330 mm -hmm. and because yeah. everyone was saying they were going to get rid of them the moment they took the airline over and they didn't and now they've just gone and bought 50 new ones. Yeah, there you go. Mm. All right, let's get to our aircraft of the day and another suggestion from our YouTube page to cover, well, it's a French airliner, Martin, first flew in 1967 or proposed in 1967, uh, first production flight in 1973. Last one flew in 1995, only 12 built. They were onto something, but, well, didn't quite get there. We're talking about the, what is it, Martin, the Dassault, how do you say the name? The Dassault Mercure. Ah, yes, it uh, looks like a 737, though it's bigger, isn't it? It's slightly bigger than a 737. I mean, I think the best way of describing it would be sort of a um, an A320-75 as opposed to a 100 or a 200. Ah, I think the uh, fuselage uh, cross-section is the same as the A320, isn't it? Well, the A320 was based on that cross-section, am I uh, right? It's very close, and, yeah. and, and the, the whole thing ties in with Delta because the follow-on for this plane, which because Dassault failed so miserably in, in trying to sell it, mainly due to the range, which we'll talk about later, yeah. a consortium got together which ended up becoming Airbus, which ended up or the, the, the Airbus as we know it now, and they put forward a couple of concepts, Jet 1, Jet 2. Jet 2 became the A320, and one of the primary airlines consulted during the whole development of the paper airplane, which was Jet 2, was actually Delta, who ended up never taking them. Ah, okay, so there's a, a link there. A very convoluted history, and 
And most of the engineers from Dassault, um, they ended up working for, they went, they just moved to Toulouse and, and went on to the Airbus program. Yeah, uh, the range, you mentioned the range, it was limited, made for what, just short jet hops between major European cities, really, wasn't it? A, c- a city hopper, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You would have thought like Lufthansa and um, Air France and all those airlines would have, uh, have taken the aircraft up, but they didn't. No. Air Inter no. was the only airline that took them. Yeah. Basically, what happened was the oil shock of the 70s and the massive devaluation of the American dollar and the fact that the Americans held most of the engine technology anyway made it very difficult for anybody not to buy Boeing or McDonnell Douglas or, or Douglas as it was in those days. So they were basically hamstrung from the beginning. They couldn't make them cheap enough and they couldn't make them fast enough. It says here in the uh, wiki entry, um, extremely modern computer tools were used at the time to develop the wing for the aircraft. It was a larger wing, it says, than the 737, and uh, the aircraft flew faster than the 7.3, but they had the same engines, the JT-8D turbofans. And, and by all accounts, it was a fine performer, um, lightly built. It only weighed 56 tonnes, or if you think in, in, you know, an A320's got 20 tonnes on that at least. It was so light, they didn't have the structure there to add extra fuel tanks, and so it was very difficult for them to make a longer range version. I was going to say, um, quite often, yeah, you, you start off with a limited range, but, uh, you know, you put in a centre fuel tank or you exploit the uh, opportunities there, but what that wasn't designed in early on. No, it, it just didn't have the, the structural um, capability to. So then they tried to make a, they tried to sell the 200, which would have been slightly longer, um, would have had, at one stage, it would have had CFM engines, CFM 56s, so it would have been quite a lot more capable. But the president of Dassault, because they were the first airliner manufacturer considering putting CFM 56s on the plane, apparently, mm. um, they thought it was too dangerous because they weren't sure that the engine would sell, and if it didn't sell, um, yeah. mm. GE would have cancelled and they wouldn't have had an engine. Now, look how badly that went for them. I'm looking at a picture of it here. They actually built in the height to accommodate a bigger engine. Yeah. You can see that it sits, um, even with the JT-8s on the Boeing 737, they are tucked in under the wing as per um, that design uh, that didn't have a pylon that Joe Sutter patented. But uh, on the uh, Dassault, uh, they're on pylons, and still it sits quite a way off. So, yeah, they were anticipating bigger engines, you can tell. Yeah, they just didn't anticipate the range, which is which is really unfortunate. But I guess they wanted to keep costs down, a lighter plane's cheaper to build. I've always thought the vertical stabilizer looked very A320-like, very. The general shape of the fuselage looks very A320-like. The, the major difference is, is that, from what I can see from photos, is that the tail planes are really upswept, you know? Uh, what's it? Anhedral, dihedral. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They had it certified for Category 3A approach all-weather automatic landing, so that's a minimum visibility of 500 feet, ceiling of 50 feet. And uh, it was also, uh, here's a bit of uh, trivia, the first commercial airliner to be operated by a 100% female crew on one of the flights. Vive la France. (laughs) There you go. None flying now, but a couple at museums, so it's still uh, possible to go and see a a mercure. They flew them for 20 years, which wasn't bad, and apparently they were absolutely, you know, reliable, absolutely no problems. Um, they flew 11 of them in the end. They reconditioned one of the um, prototypes, put it into service, and they flew for 20 years. The last one stopped flying in 1995. Yeah, that's right. Uh, carried 44 million passengers. That's not yeah. bad. 360,000 flight hours carrying 44 million passengers on a fleet of 12 aircraft. Yeah, or well, 11 that were in service. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 440,000 flights, no accidents, 98% in-service reliability. Yeah. And from the history that I've read of, of Airbus and everything, it, it really, it, it, I don't think it gets the recognition that it deserves. Although it was a failed project and there were lots of similar projects going along in the background, like there was the BAC 311 and stuff like this going on, it actually forced people into thinking along the way and it just that evolved directly into the A320. Yeah, um, it's sort of like the program that they had to have to get to that uh, next level. You were talking about those uh, two designs uh, earlier on. One of those designs was the BAE design, wasn't it? Uh, that competed with the... Uh, that ended up being, um, in the end, distilled to the A320. Yeah, and interestingly enough, the Jet 2 paper airplane design, which evolved into the A320, which had a lot of input from the Mercure, 
Initially, that was meant to be built in England by BAE, mm. and it was only at relatively late in the piece that they decided to move final assembly to Toulouse, mainly because the British government wouldn't chip in. Okay, <laughs> typical. But, but the benefit of that is, I think, they ended up with a lot of engineers from the Dassault factory. Yeah, and then the rest is history. And there you go. So that's our aircraft of the day. Thank you for that suggestion to the YouTube viewer for um, putting up the Dassault Mercure. Did I get that right? Mercure. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, uh, an, but, an unheralded classic, actually. Exactly, and probably uh, has a place uh, in history more than we think yeah. when it comes to um, air transport, being, uh, yeah, almost like the prequel of the A320. Let's put it that way. Yeah. All right, well, there we go. Another half hour flies by um, in the world of aviation. And that's about all we've got time for. So uh, I guess you're going to be um, slipping out of Melbourne for the summer holiday soon, Martin. Yeah, I'll be back in NZ um, next week and back in Australia for a week on the 15th. Oh, okay. And, and I'm trying to wrangle a flight via Sydney, Auckland and Sydney, so I can get to go on the 787. Oh, well, good luck, and uh, hopefully you will, and you can tell us all about it. Yeah. All right, in the meantime, Paul Brennan in Wellington and... Martin Oakes, still in Melbourne. See you later. Cheers.